in the event of a catastrophic epidemic initiated by bioterrorism, would we be able to care for large numbers of the sick and dying? Although the United States healthcare system has never faced a scenario so chilling, history affords us a sobering glimpse of the burdens associated with a large-scale lethal epidemic. In 1918 and 1919, the worldwide Spanish influenza outbreak sickened one of every four people and caused over half a million deaths in the United States. The flu caused social disruption and massive loss of life on American soil when the nation was already in the throes of war. Influenza overtook the U.S. in three lethal waves, incapacitating our cities at its peak in the fall of 1918. Baltimore, like other major cities, was heavily affected. Two-thirds of pandemic-related deaths occurred in October alone. Over 3,000 people succumbed to the disease. A severe worker shortage curtailed industrial production and government services. At least 25% of public safety officials failed to report for duty. Transportation, food supply, and communication networks were equally in peril. Gravediggers, also afflicted with flu, could not keep up with the demand for burials. Morgues were overflowing. Some were handling 10 times their normal capacity. Already taxed by wartime conditions, medical, nursing, and hospital services buckled under the onslaught of acutely ill and dying patients. Over one-third of doctors and even more nurses were serving overseas. Other critical support positions, orderlies, custodians, cooks, were equally understaffed. Healthcare workers were just as vulnerable to influenza as their patients. In some instances, fear of contagion kept caregivers from performing their duties. Practitioners and public health nurses faced overwhelming caseloads and frequently fielded demands for care among crowds in the street. Mounting numbers of patients delayed physician reporting of cases and deaths, making it difficult for health officials to determine the course of the epidemic and to evaluate controls such as closing public gathering places. To overcome the physician shortage, the U.S. Public Health Service dispatched its Volunteer Medical Service Corps using civilian practitioners who were unable to serve overseas. States took creative, sometimes desperate measures to compensate for too few doctors. Medical school graduations and board exams were expedited. Dentists were authorized as physicians. In an era lacking effective vaccines or drugs, there was little physicians could offer patients. Hospitals were crippled by influenza's hold on urban populations. The bulwarks of healthcare took extraordinary steps to serve their communities. Hospitals lengthened staff hours, assigned student nurses and doctors full duties, discharged the least ill, and accepted only urgent admissions. Hallways, offices, porches, and tents housed an excess of patients. Some hospitals had to turn people away. Gymnasiums, state armories, parish halls, and other facilities were fashioned into warehouses of beds for the ill. Some hospitals faced shortages of basic supplies like linens, mattresses, bedpans, and gowns. Home, and not hospital, was where most people struggled through a case of Spanish influenza. Without cures or preventive options, supportive care was critical. Few in number, nurses were essential in relieving the human suffering caused by Spanish flu. They cared for patients in hospitals and homes, provided reassurance, and instructed families in basic nursing techniques. When entire families were stricken, nurses even stepped in to assist with daily needs such as laundry, cooking, feeding, and child care. In collaboration with the U.S. Public Health Service, the Red Cross made fervent appeals to retired, private, and student nurses and women with any type of nursing experience to report for duty. Networks of social workers, visiting nurses, and Red Cross volunteers fanned out into communities helping homebound patients and their families. Despite 80 years of medical advances and expansive growth in the healthcare industry, there remains great uncertainty about our capacity today to respond to an infectious disease emergency. In many respects, we may be at a disadvantage today compared to 1918. Then, most people were cared for by family members, 
patients did not rely heavily on paid health professionals nor expect today's sophisticated standards of care. Hospitals are being financially squeezed by managed care demands to reduce costs and by cuts in government reimbursement. To survive, hospitals have taken beds offline and turned to just-in-time inventories of staff and equipment. Even minor deviations from projected patient loads can create a crunch. Regional nursing shortages further complicate the problem. These conditions were witnessed during the 1999-2000 flu season, an outbreak that was an anticipated yearly event, relatively mild and short-lived. A critical coast-to-coast -coast shortage of staffed acute beds touched off widespread ambulance diversions, severely crowded emergency rooms, and long delays in hospital admissions. Like the 1918 pandemic, demand for care rapidly outstripped capacity to respond nationwide. The 1918 influenza pandemic poses a number of compelling questions. Can hospitals cope with people converging on them in large numbers? Are there enough healthcare workers to manage an infectious disease crisis? How will we protect healthcare workers from contagion? Are there adequate supplies, equipment, and medications for a sustained outbreak? Can public health officials get enough information from hospitals to manage a modern epidemic? Could we care for patients in their homes if healthcare facilities were overrun? And finally, are we any better off today than our 1918 counterparts in our ability to handle a public health emergency?